<laughs> um, the CFCI or Care First Community Investment Grants are the result of ballot measure J, voted in by LA County residents in 2020. Care First Community Investment Funds are intended to be invested directly into communities and alternatives to incarceration that address negative outcomes caused by racially driven criminal legal system inequalities and long-term economic disinvestment. Today's webinar is being recorded. You do not have to be on camera. However, understand that if you are on camera, your image may be captured in the recording. Staying on the webinar represents your consent to being recorded. So as I mentioned, um, today's webinar is specifically on the site monitoring tool guide, and it is going to be presented by our very own Rudy Cardenas Data Manager. So Rudy, if you want to share your screen, if you're able to, there you are. Hi, good afternoon, folks. Yes, give me just one second. I'm going to and then if you have any questions throughout this webinar, feel free to put it in the Q&A section. We will address all questions at the very end of the webinar. Any that are not addressed by Rudy um, during the webinar, of course. And if you haven't already put your name and your organization in the chat, please do so. All right, Rudy, I hand it off to you now. Sorry, Mina. Uh, I don't see the ability to share my screen. Ooh. You don't have a green button? Mm -mm. You're host now, so. I don't, I don't have anything. <laughs> I can, I can share my screen. Let me open up. Yes, please. Uh, and then we can just, sorry about that. No, no worries. It wouldn't be a Wednesday without some technical difficulties, right? <laughs> I think I have yet to have a meeting on Zoom where I haven't had some kind of difficulty. No worries. <laughs> All righty. So no worries, no worries. I'm just going to click on any organization so that I can share. Uh, can you please uh, do or... TPA contracts? And T um. Yeah, if you want to share your screen and then we can start from the homepage and just switch your program to TPA contracts, I'd like to walk um, grantees kind of through the whole process. Of course. Okay, so let me do that and then this. All righty. Can you see my screen? No. No, oh, we, no. I see you. You see me. Mm -hmm. Okay, hold on. Share. Home page. Share. How now, about now? Yay. Now it's okay. Here. So. Okay. So yeah. So up top, uh, if you can change your uh, program, all programs to TPA contracts, please. You can just type yeah. Perfect. It's right there. Okay. Okay, thank you so much for all of your patience, folks. Uh, so as Mina mentioned, we're going to walk through um, the site monitoring tool. So this tool was created um, basically to help aid you folks in the, sorry, Mina, if you want to slow down and start from the from the uh, homepage. So I do know that um, grantees do not have access to this form, but I do want them to know uh, how to locate it. Uh, because they will be able to view any uh, entries that are created by our staff. Um, so as you know, as a grant advocate goes over to a site visit and if they go over this tool with you, once they enter it in Apricot, um, you will be able to view it. You just won't have access to create a new one or to make any edits. Um, so starting from your homepage, uh, so you'll go to TPA Grantee Search. you will select your org from the list. And so as Mina does that, you'll notice it jumps right into the view folder. Uh, if when you click on the name of your org, it takes you directly into your grantee profile, 
um, you would simply collect, uh, sorry, you would simply click on view folder located on the right hand side under the record options. So now that we're under our test site, we will look for the site, um, sorry, site visit monitoring tool. And so similar to anything else, we would see the page with the plus sign located on the right hand side once we click that. So as I mentioned before, this tool uh, will be filled out by your grant advocate. Now, it is a shared tool, meaning that once it's um, entered into the system, you are able to view it. But again, you're not able to make any edits or create a form yourself. Um, so we'll go through uh, the entire form. And as Mina mentioned, if you do have questions or if there's anything that I may skip over, uh, please feel free to add your questions to the chat. So uh, as in all forms, we do put in the date. Uh, we have an add button, which will connect all of your grantee information. So once you click the add button, you would be able to select your organization's name and we would uh, be able to then see all of your, thank you, Mina. We would be able to see all of your organization's info. So uh, we can see the organization name, the contract, the year, grant amount, the program area, uh, the biannual question, so uh, that basically states that this form is going to be created twice a year. Um, again, we, do, we entered quarters one through four as an option because your visit can happen in any one of the four quarters um, every year. So go ahead and scroll down, Mina. So the very first um, section that we're looking at is the person's interview during the, more, uh, during the monitoring. So uh, we have up to send, I'm sorry, up to 10 um, entries available. And really it's uh, as soon as um, your grant advocate starts to enter information, uh, go ahead and select anything from the title. As the grant advocate starts to enter information across the board, uh, you will see the, um, the sections update, right? The attending numbers update. And so this is, you know, if let's say you bring your entire team with you to the site monitoring, um, you know, everyone's name can be entered. Um, again, if there are any questions throughout, like if, if uh, let's say the title, uh, we don't have a specific title that you um, would need added, you can let us know, we can make updates. Okay, and let's go ahead and scroll down a bit. So the very first section, the administrative review. So we have uh, the executed agreement section. So under every um, under every item within Apricot, we do have our policy, our procedure, and then uh, TA, right? So technical assistance. So the policy basically states what what was agreed upon um, through the contract. The procedure is what we're doing to ensure that what we're asking for, or the information that we require, is um, being filled out, or is in appropriate location. And the TA um, section is typically like a suggestion or something that uh, technical assistance uh, thinks might be of a, a, a benefit for your organization. So as we go, th go through, we will see that, you know, we have all the different questions and, and responses that we need to put in, right? So the grantee has a copy of the fully executed standard agreement in the official file. A digital file is acceptable. So it's a standard question, yes, no, um, as your, Grant advocate would be filling this out. They would also let us know where this information is stored. If you have a file, um, if you have a binder or if you have a file cabinet that has all this information, that's typically what they would fill out within that section. Uh, the next section, organizational chart. So the grantee maintains a roster chart for all staff. Uh, thank you staff charge to the account. So basically you, you have an org chart, or, org chart of everyone that is being paid under our funding. And so again, the procedures for the grant advocate to review and verify the roster or the staffing chart. And there is a template available via Apricot. So again, uh, it's, it's a simple form that our grant advocates are uh, able to use while they're on your visit and it's it's set to be like a checklist right so as they are going through these different items with you they're able to update the drop downs with yes no responses so one of the newer items that's been uh, updated within this form so for the employment eligibility verification 
you'll see that contract section 8.7 is being referenced. If you click on where it says contract section 8.7, can you please do that, Mina? So you will get a download of a PDF for the particular um, verbiage or, or information that came directly from the contract. And so again, any piece uh, within this form that has a, a part of the contract being referenced, you would simply click on uh, the contract and it would open up to the appropriate uh, PDF or corresponding information. Thank you, Mina. Can you go back to the site tool? Awesome. Okay. So, sorry. So that was the employment eligibility, uh, eligibility verification section. So the grantee has a procedure in place to retain all employment verification documentation for all covered employees for the period prescribed by law. Uh, the procedure is for our grant, uh, grant advocates to review uh, government ID, social, social security cards, the I-9 documentation, 1099 documentation. Again, uh, the, the reasoning behind um, this is to prepare you folks for an audit. So we, we do hope that you understand that you are, you will be audited at some point in time. Uh, this is so that when that happens, you're not caught off guard or you don't know what to expect. This again is done in preparation uh, so that when you do get audited, you know exactly what is needed, um, what, what type of information um, folks, well, uh, our team will be looking for. And so that, again, so that once that happens, you're prepared, you're ready to go. Okay, go ahead and go down to the next section. So background checks at the station. Um, so the grantee should develop background check and security investigation plans, making sure that adequate checks are to be conducted for all those staff members. So basically that you're doing background checks for all of your staff. Um, and so you do have uh, three different questions. One is for staff. So you would go ahead and update that information, whether all of these were done for the staff. Uh, if you have volunteers, that, that same um, policy or same procedure was followed for your volunteers. And then, sorry, uh, Mina, can we take a look at the uh, contract exhibit A1 for the background checks? Thank you. And so this is the contract information in regard to uh, background checks and security investigation being completed by your organization. Uh, you'll also notice there are a few websites on there. So if you click on the megan'slaw.ca.gov link, um, it will take you to that particular website. Same thing with the other ones for the FBI. Um, sorry, for the FBI website. Um, sorry, go ahead and go back to the tool, Mina. Thank you. Okay, great. Go ahead and keep scrolling down. Okay, so again, something to remember is that all of these all of these questions are again related to this um, particular funding source. So if you have um, if you have staffing that uh, let's say is vacant, um, but it's not in regard to this particular grant, right? So within this grant, you have funding for let's say three um, three staff, three faculty members, uh, and those are filled, but you have other openings within the organization, we're, we're not asking about that particular information. Again, everything is in relation to the funding. So all authorized positions are filled and uh, perform grant related duties. Go ahead and um, make a selection, Mina, please. Sorry, for the sufficient staffing section. Can you go ahead and select no, please? So many of our questions are um, logic-based. What that means is, uh, so if you answer a question and select a specified response, um, you may get an additional question that basically allows you to elaborate. Um, so in this particular, for this particular question, so if not, list all unfilled positions and explanations for vacancies. So if you had, um, 
let's say you had a full team and a staff member uh, was promoted, then their position basically became uh, vacant, right? So you can list the, the name of the role and, you know, that you promoted your staff within. Or if you had a, you know, your uh, team member left, you know, there, there can be, um, you know, various reasons as to why uh, a position is vacant. Um, for our year three folks, you may still be in the process of hiring your team. So that could be very well be the reason. Okay, anticipated changes. So grantees shall notify TPA of any anticipated staffing or project changes within 15 days of vacancy. So we did make some updates uh, to your data validation form uh, to reflect these questions. So if there is uh, a change in regard to, let's say, your staffing, um, to let's say you open up a new office or you're changing location of your office um, or changing the types of services that you're going to be providing, uh, then that is something that you would need to notify TPA leadership of. That's not something that you could just do unilaterally um, based on this particular grant. So we would need to be notified um, within 15 days. Um, and so again, uh, we're trying to put in um, additional ways for you folks to let us know, uh, regardless of, uh, how can I put this? So if let's say the 15 days has lapsed, we do have other methods, um, to kind of get this information from you folks. Uh, but you are still expected to reach out to, uh, TPA leadership and let them know of the changes. Um, you know, if your grant advocate gives you the reminder, or if you see that information via, apricot within the data validation tool um that doesn't mean like oh, okay great uh they should be notified now though that's kind of sits as a reminder for you folks to again reach out to tpa leadership and let them know that change that there have been changes made uh to staffing or to you know program um the way your program is going to be operating sorry did i miss anything on that one joanne or did i cover it all I believe you covered it all, Rudy. Thank you. Perfect. Just wanted to double check. Okay. So uh, the next section, auto insurance requirements. Um, so employees who do not have automobile insurance cannot transport participants. So I did just want to point that one out as there is no policy nor procedure information. Uh, but I do want to make sure that you folks are aware and that you know that if you are transporting any participants at any point in time, um, you must have auto insurance. And again, we do have the question in regard to you transporting uh, participants to offsite activities. Can you go ahead and select a no for that question, please, Mina? Okay, and again, so um, this being the logic based, right? So if no, uh, when will insurance be acquired? Also, there is a note, um, if not advised grantee, employees who do not have automobile insurance cannot transport participants. Um, you know, again, we just want to make sure that we're all uh, covered and that we're being safe in regards to our, our staff, our participants. Um, so it is something that we wanted to highlight. Okay. So the workers' compensation, again, as mentioned, all the contracts are, um, the particular sections of the contract are available. All you need to do is click on the link. Uh, if you at any point have any problems um, pulling up um, the PDF files, please feel free to reach out to the help desk. It's helpdesk at amityfdn.org and let us know. Uh, and we will work to ensure that everything is working properly. Uh, thank you, Mina. So for the workers' compensation, the grantee maintains workers' compensation insurance for mandated employees in accordance to the California workers' compensation standards. If you respond no, you will need to identify um, when will the grantee acquire workers' compensation insurance. So again, this is um, a standard of information that you should know for all of your uh, staff members. Okay, Fair Labor Standards. So the grantee has a procedure in place to comply with all applicable provisions of the Federal Labor Standards Act. 
So on our end, we're going to review and we're going to verify FLSA and type keep, timekeeping timesheet procedure. So basically, how are you um, identifying when your when your uh, staff members, your faculty show up? And basically, you know, provide the work that they do. And then uh, this question is basically, so how is timekeeping payroll managed? Uh, so if you're using something like ADP, uh, Paylocity, pay, Paychecks, I know there's a ton of different um, systems that are, are being used, but this, uh, this is where you, we would pretty much get that information from you. Okay, so notice employees regarding the federal earned income credit. Again, we do have um, the contract piece. Uh, the grantee shall notify its employees and shall require each subcontractor to notify its employees that they may be eligible for the federal in earned income credit under the federal income tax laws. So on our end, we will verify that you have a procedure in place to notify your employees of the eligibility. So again, we're going to ask uh, it's going to be a yes, no question, whether you have, um, whether you're notifying your employees and your subcontractors. And we're also asking how are the, how are your employees being notified? Okay. So, oh, sorry. Uh, notice to employees regarding the safely surrendered baby law. Um, so within the policy, you'll notice that you do have access to a website for baby safe, uh, baby uh, and that does provide a fact sheet, um, that you're able to reference. So when you click on that link, again, it takes you directly into the website where you're able to, um, pull a fact sheet, of, pull a fact sheet, oh, excuse me. Um, you know, that gives you more information into the safely surrendered baby. Okay, uh, how are employees notified regarding the safely surrendered baby law? So you are, again, you are required to inform your, your staff, your faculty, um, your subcontractors. And so again, it's just asking the question of how are they being notified? Um, okay, so record retention and inspection audit settlement. So grantee shall maintain accurate and complete financial records of its activities and operations related to this agreement in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. Grantee shall also maintain accurate and complete employment and other records relating to, the, to its performance of this agreement. So we're going to be reviewing procedures that are in place for record retention um, for financial and all employee records. So as we mentioned, where you're working on ADP, um, you know, as your, uh, employee tracker, right. For their, um, the, sorry, the hours worked. So that could be what we'd be reviewing, uh, to ensure that everything was kept accurate. Um, if you have, let's say folks fill in a paper timesheet and then submit that, um, we would just be basically verifying that everything matches. And then it also goes into finance, right? So the budgets that you're submitting of um, on a quarterly basis that let us know of all your different expenses, we're going to basically check to ensure that they align. So there are two sections, one for the financial records and then a second for the employee. Okay, health insurance, portability and accounting act of 1996, so HIPAA. So if the grantee indeed creates, has access to, receives, maintains, or transmits protected health information, the TPA, county, and the grantee agree that the terms as set forth in exhibit one, so again, under the business associate under health insurance portability and accountability act of 1996, so basically HIPAA. Um, sorry, can you scroll back up a little more, please? So on our end, we're going to verify and ensure that uh, you have procedures in place and that your staff is trained to protect all HIPAA information. Uh, what that means is that you, um, 
So for any HIPAA related files that they are in a um, in a room that has a a door with a lock on it, uh, that it is in a locked file cabinet. Um, I believe there's, I think that might be it actually, I apologize. I think it's, uh, it needs to be within a, a room that can be closed and is, uh, and is locked and is also within a file cabinet that can be locked. Uh, and then it is also in regards to the information that you're sharing across, um, across like any of our data systems, right? If it's if it's a HIPAA related item, then specifics uh, should not be shared. Okay, go ahead and scroll down, Mina. So the grievance procedure. So the contractor shall ensure that all its service providers provide, uh, provide evidence of a grievance and resolution procedure, including in attestation that such procedure includes applicable regulatory requirements and meets all local, state, and federal laws. Uh, so go ahead and click that Exhibit A1, please, Mina. Hmm. I apologize. I think this is the wrong form. I will double check on that uh, to ensure you have the proper form placed on it. Um, but so basically, we're, we'll be reviewing the attestation form. Uh, and then um, from technical assistance, the suggestion is to create a standard grievance form or template. Um, that can be used by organization. Okay, subcontracts. So the policy is that subcontractors are subject to the provision set forth in the grantee agreement. Basically, if you have any subcontractors um, that are working with you, they are agreeing to all the same uh, material that you are. So they, they will be held under the same rules, under the same uh, expectations that all of our grantees are held. Performance reporting. So data, this is under the data and information submission section. Uh, so no less than weekly by the close of business Tuesday for the preceding week, the grantee shall collect, assess, and report participant data uh, as requested or required by the TPA and is outlined in exhibit uh, A-2 and is otherwise designated in this agreement. So this is basically stating that you will be entering data on our apricot system on a weekly basis. And so we do uh, suggest, not just suggest, but we ask for data on a weekly basis um, for, trying to choose my words properly here. Uh, it's to help ensure that the amount of information that you're needing to enter into the system doesn't become overwhelming. Um, we do know that you folks provide a ton of services and that doing data entry can be very uh, timely. It can, it can um, take up quite a bit of your time and, it, and the more data that kind of piles on, uh, the longer it will take you to enter. So in order to ensure that um, our grantees aren't overwhelmed with the amount of data that they're needing to enter. We are asking for it on a weekly basis. Okay, client tracking. So for specific program strategy, for specific program strategies, TPA will require individual level data. Grantees shall also collect and share as required by TPA through protected encrypted mechanisms, individual level um, participant data to ensure that TPA and county can access the impact of these programs on a participant's interaction with other systems and improve coordination. So this is referencing our Apricot system. So in order to um, enter into Apricot, you need to have a an account which we administer um, in order to review any of the data for your particular program or view any of your student data, 
again, you're, um, you would need to have an account or you would need to have credentials that we would um, create and we would assign to you. Our program, um, sorry, Amity Apricot <laughs> uh, is encrypted. And so in order to uh, gain access to the system, you would need, again, a username, a password just to be able to get in. Uh, if you do attempt to log in too many times uh, using the incorrect password, our system will boot you. And that is, again, to uh, ensure security purposes. Uh, and in order to regain access to the system, you would need to reach out to uh, our help desk, help desk at amityfdn.org uh, to notify them and get a, a reset password email sent to you. Okay, Authoriz authorization form for release of information. So this is the, uh, the ROI. Um, the grantee shall obtain appropriate authorizations for release of information from program participants, clients to collect and share information. Forms need to be renewed annually. So in order for you to um, share your data with us, with the county, um, in general, most of the, uh, the grantees should have an ROI, basically uh, like an intake form of sorts. Uh, we do have a sample one that is uh, in Apricot that gives you basic information and um, notifies all students of who the data is going to be shared and what data is shared. So within our um, sample form, we do notify um, any student that fills it out that uh, you will be sharing demographic information as well as student service information. Um, there are additional items that will be shared. Uh, but it does also um, touch on the longevity of uh, having to keep files or having to um, keep access to the files after the grant has, has ended. Okay, staff training and orientation. So grantees shall provide orientation and training pertinent to the grant to the grant project. So in this section. Um, our grant advocates will be working with you to, to basically identify how you're training your um, your staff members for this for this grant, um, whether it be you know reviewing HIPAA compliance rules, whether it be um, having them trained in CPR, first aid, uh, identifying that they will become a mandated reporter, um, as well as let's say getting them trained in Apricot or getting them trained in um, you know the different services that you're providing. So this is, you know, again, how are you training your staff to ensure that they are on uh, a path for success? Okay, required data report. So this section is identifying um, grantee develops program milestones as requested and in coordination with an approval from TPA. TPA and their sole discretion has final approval for proposed program milestones. All approved program milestones shall become a part of this agreement and scope of work for grantee and are submitted in the grant update report. Uh, so this is referencing basically at the end of, um, or towards the end of every year, you will be creating milestones, um, basically goals that your organization will be working towards. And these will be submitted to TPA leadership for review and approval. Now, once that has been, once they have been approved, then you will be responsible for uh, submitting updates on a quarterly basis, which will notify us of where you are with completion of each milestone. Um, okay, next section, the interventions and challenges. If the grantee has experienced operational or service delivery problems, grantee will communicate challenges in the grant update report to TPA community advocate and will and advocate will provide technical assist, assistance, uh, desk side coaching. So if there's any challenges we do like um, for our grantees to let us know. Uh, when I say us, I mean our grant advocates, basically letting us letting them know what's going on, what challenges we're facing um and if any guidance or if any um assistance is needed from our end 
then we can go ahead and do so. Okay, so the site report review summary. So per this site review, programmatic requirements specific to this grant program are being met. So go ahead and uh, select one of the responses. Go ahead and, and select now, please. So if not, what programmatic requirements are not being met? The technical assistance plan. So this is in regard to a PIP uh, contractors shall conduct administrative and programmatic reviews to ensure service providers remain in compliance with the contract requirements. The contract shall formally document administrative and programmatic deficiencies and have a mechanism in place to address repeated failures by the service provider. Contracts shall provide county with a copy of their findings within two business days of document deficiencies. So on our end, we will be providing technical assistance, uh, sorry, a technical assistance plan, formally documenting, documenting administrative and programmatic deficiencies. So if you're out of compliance, um, a PIP will be created to help you address um, what the issues are and to set a plan uh, to ensure that we're able to move forward and that you know we can then make you compliant. So the last uh, section, the additional information. So this is where if at the end of your um, meeting with your grant advocate, you have any comments you'd like to place, this is where it can be done. Um, and so you can always uh, enter the comments your own, on your own, or you can have your uh, grant advocate enter them for you. Again, this would need to be done through the grant advocates um, profile within Apricot as you would not be able to make the edits on your own. TPA recommendations. So this is this would be our um, note section. So if, like, let's say, you know, through our review, we noticed that you were missing a couple of items uh, that needed to be addressed. This is where we would let you know. The summary, again, so we would just give you a brief description of what occurred during the meeting. Um, yeah, basically simple as that. Amity staff signatures. So within the name section, our uh, grant advocate would uh, go ahead and type in their name, then they would have the ability to sign. The grantee staff signature. So you would select uh, a person from your organization that would go ahead and fill in their name and sign as well. Now, once uh, the sig sorry, once both of the staff members have signed, meaning the grant advocate and the selected person for your grant, um, you would then be able to save the record. So saving the record again on located on the right hand side under the record options section. Since we did not go through and fill out the form uh, in its entirety, we cannot um, go ahead and move forward with you know saving a fake um, entry, um, which is okay. Okay, thank you so much, folks. Uh, we are going to go through and take a look at the questions and see what everyone put. Awesome, thank you so much, Rudy. So let's go, and I can't, I can't, mm, I can't turn on my video for some reason. <laughs> okay, so where are the apricot templates located? Uh, so the apricot templates, I, I think you mean in regard to um, the ROI. In Apricot, sorry, I mean, would you mind sharing your screen again so you can show them where um, where they are sure. exactly? Uh, All righty. Okay, so if you go to your home page, Mina, please. So click on Apricot 360. And if you scroll to the bottom, there is a TPA training resources section. So within this section, you have access to technical support. Basically, it's just sending an email, which you can do that anyways. You can just email us at the help desk at amityfdn.org. You have access to the Apricot manual. You have access to a few training videos, um, one for the provider monthly uh, report, 
another for apricot so if, you know if you're a visual learner as opposed to doing uh, the actual manual there's a video that takes you over it uh, there is the ability to create batch records and the manual is also available and then the last piece is the roi sample so if you click on the click to download uh, button you will uh, basically get the download for the sample that we have and so uh, from that point you would just have to um, save it and then make adjustments as necessary okay thank awesome. you Mina. thank you um okay how often should background checks be done for staff if they are not new hires? Oh, that is a great question. Uh, Joanne, Joanne Carol, do you Carol? happen to know? <laughs> if, if there are any questions, sorry, just to know, if there are any questions that we cannot answer today, we will definitely um, make sure to jot them down and get the information for you folks. Yes. Um, but sorry, Joanne, Carol? Yeah, sure. I want to say as, um, as a best practice, um, this should be done um, at least twice a year. Um, also, uh, because these site visits will be done twice a year, um, it would be nice to have the most updated um, information when, we, when our grant advocates do go out to do um, the site visits. Thank you, John. Um, if we have staff members on 1099s who are switching over to full-time employees, do they need to be inputted into this system? When they are saying this system, are they... Rudy, did you freeze? I think he might oh. have froze. Hello? Oh, we can hear you. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, sorry, I was asking. So for that particular question, it sounds like they're asking whether they should be entering that information into Apricot. Uh, That's what it made it seem like. Um, uh -huh. You don't have to put your staff into Apricot. Apricot is only for your clients and for the people yeah. that you serve. Thank you, Mina. Absolutely correct. Uh, and then there's the grantee profile section, which is um, for the organization as a whole. Alrighty, what's the website for safe baby surrender info? Uh, it's on Africa. Sorry, give me one second. I'll pull that up. Uh, as I don't know it off the top of my head, I want to say it's at uh, baby surrender. But let me make sure I'm giving you the proper information. Of course. And then so there's other, let's go through the chat, just because I think there are some questions in this chat. Oh, that didn't work. Um, so this is being recorded. It will be posted on our Amity and You website within one week. And let's see. Okay, sorry, I have the information. It's www.babysafela.org. Uh, should I enter that in the chat or in the Q&A, would you say, Mina? Can you enter it in the chat? We'll also send an email with the link. And let's see. Ooh, there's so many people. I'm still in the intro section on the chat. <laughs> okay. Um, are there any templated procedures we can review and adapt from other grantees so, so i don't think so right rudy like grantees don't usually give us their templated their templated um works correct mm -hmm. yeah so the only thing that we uh have to share are the items that we've created so we don't, as Mina mentioned, we don't create uh, templates from our grantees, um, you know, as that's technically their intellectual property. Yes. Um, someone stated, I didn't know we could send our AI assistance in our place. Um, they actually won't be getting credit for this. Thank you, though. Um, are, oh. 
If no for transporting participants, will the question of when we are getting insurance still be a required written response field? It should not be, <laughs> but you have me questioning, so I am going to double check to ensure that it is not. Okay. Should all of this quote unquote checklist be filled out before our site visit? I'm gonna respond to that. The grant advocates are the ones that filled this um, site visit template out. So they most likely will not be able to fill it out until they go out to your site. Um, unless this is a, unless you have a meeting with them before um, to go over some of the questions. Um, actually, Rudy, that's not correct, right? Because everything has to be filled out in order to save it. Mm -hmm. So it'll have to be done on site. So your grant advocate will have to do the complete form on site. Rudy, can they get it? The question was, can they get a template version or like a blank? form of the site monitoring tool. And correct me if I'm wrong, Joanne, um, grant advocates do send this before a site visit, correct? Correct. They will send out a um, PDF version of the site visit tool so that you can review. Um, you can know what to expect when they come out and hopefully um, have some um, documents and stuff uh, prepared for when they do go out. And if you do not get that, you are more than welcome to ask. You can ask me um, as well. I can gladly provide that for you. Can we access a template for an org chart? Yes, that can be in the email recap. Sorry, or and then we can also make part. that uh, available via Africa. So within that um, same section where we put in the ROI, we can create a section just under that that um, allows you folks to download the template. When are we getting access to Apricot? So if you are a year three um, grantee, your training is next week, yay! And I wish I could put my video on so you could see like my spirit fingers. Um, we'll go over <laughs> at the end of the video. Somehow the Zoom host disabled my video. I'm Rudy, but totally fine. <laughs> um, I have never I heard that. before that this grant is discriminatory in this way. Is this a new discrimination or one that was already in place? Are we supposed to fire our staff to be in compliance with this discriminatory practice? I'm a little confused on this question. Is this regarding um, background trips? It might be. Um, if the person who asked that question would be able to be a little bit more clear on it, I was I'm a little confused on it. Are organizations able to alter the outcomes listed in Apricot to better for the organization's services? Sorry, can you read that again, Nina? Yeah, please. Yes. Um, are organizations able to alter the outcomes listed in Apricot to better the organization's services? Sorry, so I, I believe they're referencing the uh, student data portion. And so, no. So um, our outcomes are set currently. Uh, if you do have, sorry, let me let me back up. So in order for you to be able to enter your own um, outcome, you would need to be able to select other. We have discontinued the use of other in part because um, we want to keep the system and the data as uniform as possible. So what we were experiencing was that a lot of um, grantees were selecting uh, an outcome that was actually available within the system. Uh, and so 
we want to ensure that we are, again, keeping everything uniform, right? So if, let's say, uh, grantee A has a set outcome that we do not currently um, account for in Apricot, we do ask that you let us know, that you um, provide us a description of, of what the outcome is um, and how it's achieved. And we can go ahead and ensure that uh, we can ensure that we uh, update the system to include it. Awesome. What data will we have to be entering? Uh, so there is data in regards to your students. So you do need to enter, um, create a profile, which, um, collects their demographic information, first name, last name, date of birth. Um, it does collect other information, um, such as their race, ethnicity, um, gender, uh, I believe their veteran status, um, and age group. So age group can be determined based off of, um, you know, having their date of birth. Um, so that's kind of, you know, uh, 1A and 1B, so to speak. Um, we will also be collecting enrollment data, uh, which identifies when a student began receiving services with your program, uh, service data, which identifies the services that you're providing to your students and outcomes. So basically any outcomes that have been attained by that student while they were participating in this grant. Awesome. Cool. Sorry. And so that was just for students. In regard to the grantee, they are also required to enter uh, and provide quarterly reports uh, and then monthly data validations, um, which one identifies that they've entered all appropriate data for the month, um, but then also gives us um, an update as to whether there, there have been any changes to their organization, uh, whether it be staff, whether it be location, whether it be services being provided. Sorry, Joanne, didn't mean to cut you off. No worries. I wanted to, I see a lot of um, comments about the background checks and I just wanted to circle back because um, I do believe that um, that question was about the background checks. So I do want to say contractually um, at the bare minimum, um, there does need to be a search um, or some type of state or federal uh, background check for sex offenders. Again, at the bare minimum, that can be um, checking to see if somebody is registered on the um, Megan's Law website. Um, for any other um, um, background checks, it is not required under this contract, but um, if you are um, working under a certain state or local city um, licensing, um, we do um, expect and require that you are following their particular background checks as well. But for this grant at the bare minimum, it is um, only um, this, the background checks do only check for uh, sexual offenders. I hope that answers a lot of questions because I did see a lot of questions um, stating that, you know, we do hire uh, people that are, you know, in re-entry and yes, absolutely. That is totally fine. Uh, we are not looking for extensive um, background checks on this. Again, at the bare minimum, it is looking at Megan's law website. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you, Joanne. Someone asked this to clarify, this will be completed by the organization or the grant advocate. Um, to confirm, it is the grant advocate who completes this during their site visit to your organization. And then the recording will be accessible on our Amity and You websites. Do we as the organization have to pay for the background check for employees, volunteers, and program participants? So the answer to that is yes, this is not a, none of the background checks apply to program participants. Um, it does apply to all of your employees, volunteers, and subcontractors. Do one-time speakers need to go through background checks? Um, yes, that would be considered a uh, subcontractor. Um, and so again, at the bare minimum, it would be the Megan's Law um, website search. And will they have to provide the background checks? Do they have to share them? Um, I would say that share them with us. Yeah. I guess if the question is sharing them with us, um, the grant advocates will be looking at that 
when they um, come out to your site? Should independent contractors be included in the organizational chart? Good question. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think if you would like to include them in there, then, you know, that would be helpful. Okay. What does TPA stand for? Third party administrator. How about change in budget that is not staff related? You can um, do budget modifications twice a year. Um, that can be to anything which is staff related um, or uh, program line items. Um, any requests such as that would go through your grant advocate. Um, that is your main point um, contact uh, for this grant. Um, they will then move it, um, you know, to myself or other leadership, wherever it needs to go, or to our finance team. Um, but again, please contact your grant advocate for any of those requests. Um, yep, I think, that, I think that answered it. Staff who are covered by agency insurance, but don't personally have a vehicle or insurance, can they transport participants in agency vehicles? No. And how does this apply to independent contractors? Oh, would you be able to give a little bit more information on that one? Is there a standard form for the weekly reports? So when we talk about weekly reports, we're talking about the data. Mm -hmm. um, give a, can you give a little bit more information, Rudy, on that one? So there is a report available um, via Apricot, and it's a live report that um, shows you all of the data your organization has entered uh, for your students. So it, it will give you a, a full list of all your student um, profiles. It will show you all the enrollment forms that have been created, uh, services that have been entered, outcomes that have been entered. Uh, within that section, you're all also able to view if any of your students are missing information, such as an enrollment form, or they haven't um, had a service entered. And as well as that, you're also able to view all of your data validation um, monthly reports that you've submitted to uh, to TPA. Now, in regard to missing enrollment forms, so every one of your students should have an enrollment form. Um, it could have been the case that when you were entering the data that, you know, maybe uh, you went through like a bunch of folks and you just accidentally skipped uh, entering that information. Uh, but if that's the case, the system will flag, will flag that student for you and, and identify it for you. Uh, that report is also, um, you are also able to export that report into Excel if needed. Awesome. Can I, can I just say something real quick, Mina? So I know that we're, we're a little bit past three o'clock and that folks oh. do have to jump off. Um, so um, thank you for those that um, have joined and do need to jump off now. We will um, stay on and and continue with the questions as much as we can. Um, any questions that were were not answered or we cannot answer at the moment, um, we will um, have those answers for you in a Q and A um, and send that out as well. Thank you. Does HIPAA apply to non healthcare orgs? So, yes. Um, just because as an organization you are collecting client information, you do do that during their enrollment. So even though you are not a healthcare organization, you may not be a healthcare organization, you still have to ensure that you are protecting clients information. Um, along with that HIPAA section in your contract, it also talks about privacy. So um, just wanting to make sure that all of your client information is covered and that you have, you know, what's it called? Security measures on it. Um, so if a budget needs to be changed, should we just notify our grant advocate and writing for approval? Yes, you should. Does working with veterans need a background check? They are not youth. Some may be women, very few. When they say working, do they mean like providing services to? Yes. Or do they mean, yeah, if it's providing services, your, your, um, your students, your participants do not need a background check. Uh, so that's strictly for, um, faculty or, or staff of your organization. 
Um, are we assigned a certain grant advocates? Yes, everyone is yes. assigned a grant advocate. If you have a question on who it is, please send us an email. And uh, are we allowed to ask everyone, are you a registered sex offender? Um, I wouldn't necessarily ask the question, but um, you are you are required to type their name in the Megan's Law website and do your own uh, background background check in that way. Do we need to create written policies and procedures for describing fair labor standards, federal in earned income notifications, how we maintain financial records, grievance procedures, etc. Yes, that is recommended in the contract. Will, oops, um, are background checks required for programs that do not work with minors? Yes. And uh, how often will the grant advocate meet with a grantee? So grant advocates are to have um, contact through either phone calls, well, it must be one, at least one phone call um, and or um, email um, twice a month. Um, so again, those are either through phone, that can be through a team Zoom meeting, um, communication through email uh, twice a month, um, but physically uh, going out to sites will be uh, twice a year. What type of audit will we be subjected to? All documents or just financial? Um, it depends what type of audit. Um, if we're looking at finance, then we will look at finance, financial documents. Um, we will look at, um, if we're looking at financial documents, then we'll, we will need to see also personnel documents that those, um, you know, uh, salaries are being paid to. Um, again, services, if we're looking at services, um, we are going to um, look at what is being done in services, again, and tie those financial documents to those services as well. So um, that's why it's important to keep, um, you know, everything documented, um, you know, timesheets, personnel, um, how people are getting paid, um, all your receipts that are spending. And again, this is only under this grant, um, anything that is spent under this grant, um, um, keeping receipts. And again, the, the, the audits, um, will come from Amity, but they also might come from the county as well. And so, um, you know, each entity is going to be looking at different things. Um, if they don't have a physical site, how would their site visit be done? If you don't have a physical site, um, so I know startup, some folks will not have a physical site in the beginning. Um, so that those types of things, either um, it could be done virtually where we're looking at documents, um, you can send them ahead of time so that the grant advocate can review those documents and then go over them with you um, virtually. Um, or, um, you know, you can come to our office um, and bring the documents here um, and, and do the check off list and the, and the site visit monitoring tool um, here in the office. And then when you get your site, we will do the actual physical site. I know some um, um, grantees only provide uh, virtual services. So again, that would be um, either sending the, the documents um, through email, reading them together and going through that site monitoring tool together virtually. How much advanced notice will they be informed of um, for their site visit? So typically our advocates will start scheduling um, site visits um, three to four weeks ahead of time. And will a PIP be required if we are delinquent in one area? Um, so there are several areas that we um, look at when initiating uh, performance improvement plans. Um, those are, um, and we will put them in, in, in our processes um, in, in writing as well, but um, if you're late on quarterly reporting, 
um, more than 30 days, have not entered data more than 30 days, um, non-responsiveness um, will will um, also trigger a performance improvement plan, um, being out of compliance with insurance um, um, and non-responsive. So we do, you know, we do have organizations that, you know, um, let's say their insurance has lapsed and now they're out of compliance. Um, we do have a team that uh, works on insurance We'll reach out to you to get you uh, to communicate with you and let you know that your your insurance is now expired um, and work with you to get that. But we have experienced some non-responsive in that area um, where we have had to initiate performance improvement plans based on that as well. So as long as there's communication and responsiveness, um, this is not the performance improvement plan is not something that you will be blindsided by. Um, there is always communication um, on on um, compliance issues that come up, but there's again we're very flexible on assisting you and providing you the TA to get you uh, where you need to be as well. Um. Okay, hold on. Um, do we need to have items completed to share during the site visit meeting or are we simply going to discuss them? You should have them perfect, perfect, sorry, prepared uh, to show them to your grant advocate. If it's something that you don't have, um, you're, you know, you're not going to get in trouble for it. It's not something that, oh, you know, you don't have this particular item. And um, you know now you're going to be put on a performance improvement plan. Um, this is something that you know if you do if it's smart to know that you don't have, then we just know that that is something that we need to help support you um, in getting to that point to where um, you are in compliance with that particular item. And. Uh... For the ROI, is that a requirement? We work primarily with youth in schools and juvenile detention facilities. Although we have program permission forms, we are highly restricted from gathering specific data from probation and school district officials. We would look to share the ROI with the permission form, but some of our partners, guardians, parents, and authorities do not feel comfortable or are not authorized to provide data. So, we do require an ROI from all um, all students, all participants. I know, uh, and this is just you know from my history working with uh, schools. So what we used to do was we would provide um, our template or our, our intake form um, to the school we were working with for review, and they would send it out with their school packet. This would allow us to have the parents fill out the form and sign, and if um, you know, for whatever reason, they didn't want to share the information, um, then we were identified at that point as well. But yes, we are, we do expect an, or do need to have an ROI for any and all students. And is there any way that we can change the contracts? How so? I'm like, and that would no. be a, I'm like, I don't. <laughs> There no, no, there's no way to change the contract, no. All right. And uh, I see. I think. Um, I think that is it. The others seem to be um, repeats. Um, and I think, yeah, I think that's it. Okay. So. And, and again, that. anything not answered, we will go through, we will go through the chat and go through all the questions and anything not answered, we will um, put together a Q and A. And if you have anything additional, please reach out to your graphic. Yes. All right. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining on and, uh, well, joining us today. <laughs> um, sorry I went over. There were a lot of questions. 
Um, again, this video is being recorded. It will be on our Amity and You website within one week of today. If you have not checked out our Amity and You website, I really, really encourage you to do so. All of our webinars are on the website as well as Meet Our Staff and Grantee Spotlights. So if you want to get to know your fellow grantees in either year one or year two, all of their information is in our internal resource guide. Year three, we're collecting information from you currently right now. So if you checked out our bulletin last week, please fill out the form. We'd love to learn a little bit more about you and how other grantees can get in touch with you. Next week, we do have apricot training with Rudy. So we'll have another week with Rudy again, those spirit fingers telling you. Um, so we'll have apricot training. This is specifically for year three. So year one and year two grantees, if you do not need apricot training, feel free to skip next week. However, if you do have a staff member who needs apricot training or you have a new staff member who needs it or someone wants to get a refresher, feel free to come through to the webinar. It will also be recorded, so you're more than welcome to catch it on the Amity and You website. But I think that is it. Have a lovely, lovely Wednesday afternoon, everyone. And if you have any questions, please reach out to us via email or contact your grant advocate. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Thank you, folks. Thank you, everyone.